And we are back. Hello again. It's the Horror Guys with episode number... 123. I'm Kevin. I'm Brian. And we're here to talk about some horror movies. We got how many? We got four horror movies. And a short. And a short. Just like always. We're going to talk about them all. Yep. So, pick up our books. Horrorguys.com slash books. And let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> that was our promo. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> this week we've got... Four brand new, well, at least 2001 movies, most of which are available, all of them? No, most of them are available on Shudder. Uh, One of them is an HBO show. So we've got The Devil Made Me Do It, The Conjuring 3. Yeah, it's number three for The Conjuring, but it's like seven or eight. I didn't count in the series. Annabelle and all those are Uh are part of the series. The Nun. Yep, Uh uh-huh. Then we've got fried berry. Mmm, I love berries. You like fried bologna? Mm -hmm. This is fried berry. Fried berries. Mm. A caveat. Beware. Mm -hmm. And psycho gourmet. Psycho gourmet. Psycho gourmet. Yeah. Yeah. And a shorty called the chills. The chills. Brr. What should we talk about first? Well, let's talk about the big one of the group, The Conjuring 3. The Conjuring, the movie that everybody's talking about. The Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It. Now, is Based still, on a true story. Is this still at theaters? Or is this... I think it is still at theaters, yes. Okay. It's it's on theaters and HBO at the same time. It was one of those simul-release simul things, because yeah. things are still weird theater-wise, attendance-wise. and mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is only only came out like two weeks ago, maybe a little less. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, we saw it on TV and not yeah, the theater, yeah. but you know, I wondered if it I was think at it is the on theater the theaters still also, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, don't, I didn't hear how well it did. I don't usually watch too much box office news. Yeah, I didn't pay much attention to the stats there. Directed by Michael Chavez, written by David Leslie Johnson McColdrick. He's got four names. He's got, he's got more names than he's entitled to. <sighs> and James Wan. Stars Patrick Wilson, Vera Farmiga, and Ruari O'Connor. Hour and 52 minutes. Well, what'd you think? I wish they would stop making country movies. <laughs> okay. There, I said it. I'm tired of these. All right. I mean, it wasn't bad. I mean, you know, it was, yeah, more of the same. It was, uh, definitely, yeah. I'm just tired of them. Well, I mean, you know, at fundamentally you are offended at their core, by the true I'm story fandom, aspect. I'm, I'm offended by the true story. Yes, they don't present these as fiction. They present these as you know, this was inspired by true events. <sighs> the two main characters are were were real people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were frauds and fakes, but they were real people. Okay, I looked it up. Their budget was thirty nine million, and the box office made one forty two point eight. So they, they did rather well. In COVID times, that's not like a real big markup. They, yeah. So Horror they, films are mostly so pretty because cheap. It, because it made $100 million, they'll probably make more. Oh, yeah. In three, in three years, <laughs> we'll be talking about The Conjuring Part 52. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yes, fine performances, a well-made movie, but boy, I'm tired of these. Okay. I, now, just, I don't I just, mind yeah. them as much as you do. I kind of like yeah. them. Mm, okay. I'd rather watch purely fiction movies. They're that well, aren't pretending to be something real. Reasonably based, based well real. done. Uh, like you said, well acted. Mm-hmm. Special oh, effects yeah. are good. Yeah, those two lead actors. Are just, I'm thoroughly yeah. entertained. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was not I was not, not entertained, you know, because of the performances and the effects and stuff. But, I, but fundamentally, I kind of sighed internally. So you're Maybe. all in on <laughs> werewolf movies and space alien movies and creeping blob movies that are pure fiction. But once you start saying based on a true story, you're it expecting really a documentary. It really turns me off, <laughs> yes. <laughs> on July 18th, 1981, Ed and Lorraine Warren were called to document the exorcism of David Glatzel. He was eight years old. The Exorcist arrives, and boy, does the Exorcist arrive! Yeah, did they steal these scenes? Oh, the, they steal a, these shots from any that famous was films? A you've homage seen? to uh, <laughs> a certain other known Exorcist movie. <laughs> Wait, there's another Exorcist movie? <laughs> yes. <laughs> David possessed stabs his father, and Ed tells the priest, "We have to do this right now." The boy leaves Wolverine-style claws on the walls as they drag him downstairs, and it is certainly a violent and active. 
uh, scene. It is. Yeah, era. a lot yeah. going on here. Yeah. The thing in David goes full exorcist, throwing things around the room and laughing at them while twisting into impossible shapes. Except, as we'll hear later, they're not impossible they're shapes. They're not impossible shapes. They yeah. had a contortionist actually do those stunts. When a that body little kid double. is yeah. when that little kid is flopping around on the table, bending over backwards. They CGI'd his real. face on a real person doing that contortion. Yeah, yeah and that's amazing. <laughs> the only CGI yeah. was this face swap. Uh-huh. Well, uh Take me, shouts the older teenage boy much like the uh, priest in The Exorcist. Uh And the demon is more than happy to do that. Sure enough. Ed then has a demon-induced heart attack, so no one really followed up on the older boy, Arnie Johnson. And then the credits roll. Wait, that was all pre-credits? That was a lot of action. It's a lot going on here. And I got to say, I was very entertained with that. It was fast, it was quick, and it was ripping off The Exorcist right and left, but it was well done. Yes, it was. Yeah. Ed wakes up and tells everyone that it's got Arnie. Oh, Meanwhile, yeah, we forgot about Arnie. <laughs> Arnie starts behaving strangely and seeing things. Arnie's obnoxious brother is obnoxious, and Arnie stabs him 22 times, thinking it's a demon. And maybe it is a demon, we don't know. We soon see Ed and Lorraine visiting Arnie in prison. They have him read from the Bible, which he can do, and that proves he's not possessed now, but he might have been at the time. They talk to Arnie's lawyer. They want to plead that Arnie was possessed at the time, a defense that has never worked in the past. They invite the lawyer to their house to look at their evidence, and she's completely convinced. They plead not guilty by reason of demonic possession. And I haven't done any research, but I'm guessing up to this part is fairly oh, yeah. real. Uh huh. Yeah, it was a real. Yeah, a real believe thing. in the demons or not, the lawsuit part was true. Yeah, inspired by true events. Yeah, yeah it was a true cr- a crime that really happened. And, and did he get off? Um, you looked at this up, up well, at one point. This is the same way it happened in the movie. Okay. Yeah. Well, he didn't get. What, what happened at the end of the movie with the trial? Did it actually give a result? Uh, yeah, but I can't remember what it was. It, I don't know that they ever gave a result. Yeah, well, yeah, they did. We'll see here when we get to the end of the summary. Yeah, they did. I can't remember what it was. It wasn't, it was kind of a slap on the wrist compared, you know, relative to how violent the crime was. Okay. Why did the demon disappear? Demons don't act like this normally. We get a flashback to five months ago. It's moving, it's moving in day, and little David is attacked by something in his waterbed. Later, Ed and Lorraine find floor damage where the waterbed used to be, and Lorraine goes under the house to see what's really down there. She finds dozens of rats under there, as well as a witch's totem. This totem invited the demon into the house. David was cursed, and the curse was passed on to Arnie. They go see the former, Father Kastner, who knows about these totems. He's got a creepy room full of satanic memorabilia, Just like they do. But for some reason, they're creeped out by his toys. (laughs) They got Annabelle and all that other creepy crap in their bedroom. And this guy's got the same kind of room, and they think there's something wrong with him. Oh, um, and going back, I I looked up. Uh I couldn't remember the specific of what it was. I I, uh, found guilty of first-degree manslaughter charges, sentenced to 10 to 20 years, actually served... Five for good behavior. Manslaughter, not Man, first degree manslaughter, murder. Manslaughter, not five degree murder. So, okay, a lesser murder charge. A lesser charge. Yeah. Elsewhere, the Satanist is doing another ritual, and Arnie spills a mop bucket in the prison infirmary. Ed gets a call from a policeman in Massachusetts who has seen a totem just like it. The Warrens team up with Sergeant Clay to solve a missing persons case. Lorraine gets a visit, vision and solves the case. The Lorraine uses the recovered corpse to get a vision of the Satanist. Lorraine and the occultist have an astral conversation. She knows who we are, Lorraine warns. You can break the curse by destroying the altar it was cast from. Ed reads from an old book. Just gotta find it. Yeah, where is this altar? Lorraine has seen the altar in her vision, but she doesn't know where it is. They soon find another totem in their own home. Oh. Yes, you are targeted. Father Kastner explains that the curse needs three victims to be completed. There have been two so far, and Lorraine is sure that Ed is number three. Kastner explains that he had a child with a woman who died in childbirth, and he raised the child on his own. 
He believes his own obsession passed to his daughter. She knows the tunnels under his land, and she probably built her altar there. Lorraine leaves just as the occultist confronts her father. Meanwhile, at the prison, the priest and Debbie, Arnie's girlfriend, are there with him. Things start exploding and the lights go crazy as the priest watches helplessly. Hmm, what's worse than a prison break? Demonic prison break. Demonic prison break. Lorraine goes through the tunnels and finds the occultist's lair. Lorraine and the woman fight in the tunnels as Ed tracks them both down. Ed is possessed and chases Lorraine all over the tunnels with a sledgehammer. Lorraine finally gets through to him, well, standing right next to the altar, and he uses the hammer to smash the altar and stop everything. Happy ending! Yay! Yay! Sometimes later, sometime later, the de- the possession defense works, and Arnie is convicted of manslaughter instead of first-degree murder and a death sentence, there serving only five years. All right. So who knew a table could be so important? Smash the altar, smash the curse. Easy peasy. And for a guy recovering from a demon-induced heart attack, Ed sure does run around a lot in this. Yeah, he recovered well for that. From that. Yeah. <laughs> it's never really explained why the occultist chose those particular victims. This is basically, it's a mystery with a supernatural twist. Who done it? Will they find murderer, the murderer in time? And what clues do they follow? Well, spoilers, they do. Well, I do like films where the main characters aren't in constant doubt, denial, or need to be convinced of whatever evils the movie pits them against. Yeah, they just got right to it. You know, like in the movies where they what's a vampire? Really? Really? Oh, what world did you grow up in? I don't believe in vampires. Yeah. <laughs> Demons? What are those? <laughs> yeah, Witches they, aren't real. They do get right to it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they don't waste their time. And another example of this is like superhero origin stories. How many times do we need to see Batman's parents get shot? How many times do we need to see that kid get bit by the spider? We don't. Come on. We're past that. Yeah, let's see what they can do when they know what they're doing. And this movie is past that. They just get right to it. Right from the opening, the pre-credit scene, they get right to it. Yeah, Yeah. this one with Ed and Lorraine, they avoid all that nonsense entirely. They, along with the audience, believe in the demons from the get-go, but they don't know the specifics. The films are supposed to be based on true events, which is clearly ridiculous. The Warrens were frauds at best, and I've heard there are even worse stories that I'm not going to repeat here. Still, taken as a purely fictional story, it's pretty good, as I think all the Conjuring films are. Okay. Anyway, I liked this one. Yeah, it's was all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next up. Okay, and again, The Conjuring was on HBO, or you can go see it at the theater still if you hurry. Next one, uh, the next three are all on Shudder. We signed up for Shudder again. It's our Shudder month on. And that's really a good deal if you're in horror movies. Yeah, Shutter it's one of those things we subscribe every few months to get caught up. It's not like we pay, what is it, five ninety nine a month every month? But even if you pay every month, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's very a good deal. They got a lot the of amount stuff. of value. Uh-huh, yeah. Totally. And we're not affiliated with Shutter, but we would be if they had affiliated. Shutter wants to sponsor us, you know. (laughs) All right. Well, one of their new movies this week is or recently is Fried Berry from 2020. F R I E D fried, like cooked in berry, brain fried. Yes, the guy named Berry, not not the fruit berry. Written and directed by Ryan Kruger, stars Gary Green, Shanella D. Jager, and Brett Williams. Hour and thirty nine minutes. What'd you think? I thought it was a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> a hoot is a good idea, a good word for Boy, it. Boy, yeah. it's a strange movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it totally is. Mm-hmm. Certainly the strangest movie this, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> you right. know what? It, it kept reminding me in some ways the the style of photography and the mind trips and stuff that uh, Nicolas Cage movie Mandy. Remember that one? It's similar. A lot yeah. of the colors and the, stuff. The yeah. colors and the way he was wandering around, you know, not quite knowing what was going on. And we weren't quite sure what was real and what was in his head. You know, they, they, it kept reminding me of that. I think all yeah. of it was real in this. It oh, was it, just weird. It was very weird. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Barry is a heroin addict and his wife nags about how he's a poor provider. They fight and he walks out. And Barry wearing like dirty clothes. He's got hair down to his elbows. It looked like it was washed at least a month ago. 
he is not a pretty man. <laughs> if there was ever a meth head living in your neighborhood, it looks like Barry. Wow. All right, so he heads to the local bar instead of going to wherever he said he was going. His friend at the bar makes a great case about how racist Disney is. And, well, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh-huh. The two of them then leave without paying and go get high. All right, so clearly this is a morality tale here. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, Barry walks home in a weirdly lit fog. Then he walks into a beam of red light and flies up into an awaiting alien spaceship. Is he hallucinating? Well, no. <laughs> no. It really isn't. It really, yeah, it really is happening. He's probed and prodded in the usual ways and then released. He walks the streets of the city. But is it really Barry or is it an alien in Barry's body? Yeah, I think that was the thing. Yeah. He, he was possessed, possessed by Possessed or a, replaced or body swapped or I, something. I think they were both in there. I think it was Barry and the alien. A passenger. Uh-huh, yeah. Just like a tourist. Barry well, goes into let's a Let's bu- check out this Earth thing. <laughs> <laughs> what a oh, trip, he learned. And what a trip he had. <laughs> well, Barry goes into a bar and listens as the bartender and customers talk. He doesn't say anything. He then gets pulled into a nightclub and someone gives him ecstasy because clearly he needs more drugs. He then grabs the packet and has a dozen more of the pills. <laughs> yeah, one, Eat them all. If one is good, let's take a dozen. <laughs> it takes effect and he dances insanely. He then does something very nasty with a guy in the restroom and then goes home with a girl. She has a very quick, very needy sex with him and then she throws him out. We're done. Get out. Another girl takes him home for sex. He has no idea what's going on, but he doesn't make her stop. This girl, over a course of seconds, gets fat and gives birth to a normal looking baby. In about a minute. Yeah. He works fast. (laughs) Then her pimp comes in and throws Barry out. I don't think it was supposed to go like that. The sun comes up and Barry keeps on walking. There's a man man talking about aliens amongst (laughs) us. And Barry listens for a while. He sees a father feeding a baby. There's a guy having a heart attack, but Barry fixes him. Barry's angry wife throws him in the car and rants for a while as he sits there silently. He then goes home and feeds his own son. He makes love to his wife. Maybe he's actually learning to be better now. The two go to the grocery store and encounter more strange people. Barry starts going through convulsions. She decides to take him to the hospital, but he jumps out of the car and runs away. Eventually, he just starts flying around like Superman. A group of guys beat him up. And then there's an intermission. (laughs) What? What? (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'm not going to read this whole thing because you haven't seen it, and we probably you should probably go see it. It's very good. Yeah, it is. I thought it was excellent. All right, so skipping down to my commentary, the full review is on the horrorguys.com site if you want to read it. But this is why South Africa is not a big tourist destination. (laughs) Well, they don't sell it as a tourist destination. Boy, they don't, no. (laughs) And yeah, this is a South African film, but we couldn't quite place the accents. We were thinking. It took us a little while to figure out. What is this? Australian. No. Yeah, no. No, no, yeah. South South African. African. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I think they show the very worst that South Africa (laughs) has to offer. Well, and that's basically it. Barry is a weird looking, scary guy, but you soon see that he's not only ignorant, but innocent and all the crazy things going on on planet earth he moves from one situation to the next encountering crazy funny twisted characters all night long and watching their reject reactions while on drugs while various drugs (laughs) is he really though yes yes i think he's a little under the influence and he picks up he gets a ride with the guy in the car and they just totally blitz out on something oh yeah they do Yeah. yeah yeah well the various south african accents are really strong and i kind of recommend subtitles for this one well after a while you get used to it though i found it easier to follow i think the longer i watched yeah yeah, yeah. so let them are slurring their words and things like that but definitely you get the hang of helps. it yeah i imagine some of the regional accents and phrases have some meaning there that an, as an american flew right over my head because mm-hmm. they got all the little in jokes and you know regional stuff going on mm-hmm. there was clearly a lot more going on socially than i understood yep. because yeah we're not yeah, from I, there. I agree yeah and still it was surprisingly entertaining very entertaining yeah i think that's my favorite of the week really yeah okay yeah i, w- I would put it my favorite of the week yeah 
Mm, I'm going to have a hard time choosing on this one. I'll, I'll give you my answer at the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, and we had a short film. What was the short film? The chi- that the, chill. The chills. I almost said the chilling. No, the chills. Well, I mean, you watch it long enough, you might get a chilling. Yeah, you might. This one's from 2019. There's a link in the show notes where you can go watch this one on YouTube. We saw this at a film festival. We did, but you can watch it at home on your phone. Written and directed by Brooke Edler Hebert. Stars Catherine Bailey, Josh Bolanger, and David Hebert. Seven whole minutes. Worth the investment. Absolutely. So, a girl dances alone in what looks like an early 80s bedroom. So it's kind of retro. The radio announces a manhunt for a serial killer, and she gets a creepy phone call and runs to hide. She grabs a knife. Halloween, the movie-style music, starts playing as a masked creep enters the house. So yeah, it's basically it's Halloween or one of those Jason movies or something like that. Mm -hmm. They struggle, and the killer ends up strangling her with a phone cord. The killer turns out to be another girl. She then finds a boy tied up in a dark room and helps him out. Wait, what? What? Huh? Huh. What's going on here? Well, when they started playing the Halloween-like music, it kind of gave away what they were going for here and made the ending a little too obvious. But overall, I did like it. Yep, me too. I like the 80s retro. Yeah, that was fun. Worth checking out for sure. All right. And then one that, um, well, we'll see what we had to say about this one. I'm guessing you're going with Psycho Gorman next? No, we're going to go with Caveat. Oh, caveat. I think we disagree on Psycho Gorman quite a bit. Uh, caveat, I don't know what you think, but we'll find out here in a minute. I think caveat I... is another one of those Shutter movies from 2021, mm-hmm. written and directed by Damian McCarthy, stars Ben Kaplan, Connor Duane, Jonathan French, hour and 28 minutes. What did Kevin think? I thought that, um, yeah... I thought Jonathan Jonathan French was a mighty good actor in this. And which I, one was he? A, he was the main guy. With the main the beard. guy. Okay, he's main third guy, billing. Main okay, guy with the beard, which is weird that he's third billing because you know, um, yeah. Oh, oh. Do you recommend it? I don't know. I almost want to see it again <laughs> to see with extra flashlights. <laughs> yeah, boy, I I've never been so disappointed partway through a movie. It was really good for the first 45 minutes. And then the lights went out. And what happened after that? It was hard to tell. (laughs) It was too dark. And also you couldn't tell WTF was happening. It got jumbled and dark and... uh, What? I think I caught all that happened. It was so good at the beginning. I mean, the first part was so good and so gripping and... Their performances were so good, and it was so intriguing, and the lights went out. What? Wait. I, what's, and the lights what? stayed out. Are they doing something? I hear rattling chains. What? Okay, there's <laughs> an arrow? Yeah. Okay, what? <laughs> a woman walks into a dirty old room, holding a really creepy drumming rabbit toy in front of her. And if you watch the trailer, you see this rabbit toy, and it's really creepy. Yeah, it's really the creepiest cool toy ever. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to really have anything to do at all with the plot. No. The rabbit no, toy doesn't talk. Thing. It doesn't kill people. It's just a toy. He cuts a hole in the wall. Somewhere else then. Barrett offers Isaac a job babysitting. He wants someone to look over his niece on an isolated property. It is 200 a day for not more than five days. She's got some psychological problems, but she, but she's harmless. There's got to be more to it than that, Isaac says. He's waiting for the caveat. The caveat. Credits roll. When he sees the house is on an island, Isaac points out that he can't swim, so he couldn't leave the island. Well, it's lucky we have a boat then, isn't it? Laughs Barrett, who then goes home on the boat. (laughs) (laughs) The house is dirty, dingy, and all around nasty. Barrett explains that Olga doesn't like to be touched and that Isaac must never go into her room. Olga is terrified of someone attacking her in her sleep. Barrett gives Isaac a harness with a chain. Caveat, you say? Yeah, just a little bit. And this harness and chain will keep him out of certain rooms of the house. He's like on a leash in the house. Isaac is a big pushover, so he agrees to wear the leash anyway. Barrett then leaves Isaac alone in the house with Olga and takes the boat back to the mainland. 
The chain doesn't reach far enough to even let him use the bathroom. Here's a bucket. Ew. That <laughs> night, as Isaac, Isaac tries to sleep, there are shenanigans with a painting. Which made no sense. Afterwards. The house is definitely creepy, and he finds the rabbit toy thing. Olga comes in, carrying a crossbow. She's awake and talking now. Isaac doesn't completely remember who he is, and he's not even sure how he knows Barrett. Olga's mother was insane, and her father committed suicide at that very same crossbow. Isaac goes down into the basement and sees the hole Olga dug in the pre-credit sequence. He looks inside and spots Olga's dead mother inside. Isaac then makes his way to a telephone and calls Barrett and tells him about the body. He explains that he can't call the police as he's not sure where they are. Barrett says to wait. I'll come. I'll take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> Olga explains that Barrett killed her mother and now he'll never let Isaac leave. Olga says that Isaac has been here before, about a year ago. He left his jacket then. Isaac was the one who locked her father in the basement. Isaac doesn't remember any of this and he doesn't believe it but the jacket fits. They call Barrett, and he confirms it, which at least proves that Olga isn't delusional. The dead body in the basement has the key to Isaac's chain, so he tries to get it, which is easier than expected. Yeah, it was. He then gets out of the harness, the power goes off, and um, mostly indecipherable things happen in the dark for the next 45 minutes. Now, there, was that the flash, flashbacks were after that point or before? I don't remember. Uh, there were some flashbacks after that. After that. Yeah. yeah those were The letters. actual, actual yeah. everything in the house is pretty much black at this point. It's very dark. He finds Olga in a harness of her own now, but he doesn't have the key to that one. Isaac starts to remember... I'm going to go ahead and read this whole thing because I'm not entirely sure what happened, so it's not really a spoiler. Okay. <laughs> Isaac starts to remember agreeing to lock Olga's father in the basement last year. Olga starts hunting Isaac with a crossbow, clipping his ear once and hitting him in the leg the second time. We then get another flashback to Isaac coming to the house in the past and wandering around in the dark then as well. Olga's father was already locked in the basement, and Isaac had nothing to do with it. Somehow, somehow, Isaac ends up crawling around inside the walls, but he's clearly not alone in there. Barrett arrives, and he wants to know what's going on. Olga shoots him in the shoulder and locks him in the basement. Isaac crawls through the, calls through the intercom, but now Barrett wonders who's that in the basement with him. He thought it was Isaac. Yeah. I'd say fade to black, but it's been black for 35 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> All right, so as bad li Barrett padlocked the harness, harness on Isaac, I told Kevin, Isis is the... Isaac is the dumbest character who ever lived. Who would possibly do this job? Well, he's certainly malleable and agreeable. And I'm not yeah. going to retract that statement after the film either. Stay on this island that you can't leave, using with a crazy girl that you can't touch. Here's a chain, a leash, and a harness that you can't escape from. Oh, and you can't even poop. Not an I'll come back anyway. for you Monday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, the house is perfect for this kind of film. It's not quite falling down, but it's completely skeezy and the kind of place you wouldn't want to touch the walls, much less walk barefoot. And she does. She walks around barefoot everywhere. Mm -hmm. The place is all dim, mysterious, and atmospheric, which was really well done. The first hour, which focused on the situation in the house with the crazy girl, was really good. And I thought Jonathan French and Layla Sykes... Neither of them have much filmography mm -hmm. in you in uh, IMDb, uh, but I thought their performances were really excellent. I think all the acting was good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. once what well, you could see. Mm. Once the power went out and Isaac started having flashbacks, the film ground ground to a halt and never recovered. At the ending, I have no idea what happened. <laughs> See, that's why I kind of want to see it again. No, I would be perfectly happy never seeing this again. Okay. I kind of regret watching it the first time. It gets a three from me. Oh, harsh. It's a bad one. Hmm. I won't harsh it that bad. All right. Which takes us to our final movie of the week, 
probably the most anticipated one on the list from what I've seen on some of the, the groups I'm in. Psycho Gorman from 2020, directed and written by Stephen Kostansky, stars Nita, jo- Nita Jose Hanna, Owen Meyer, and Matthew Nidaber. Hour and 35 minutes, also on Shudder. And you're making pruny face. What do you think, Kevin? What do you think? It was okay. It was okay. It was okay. That's as, that's, that's as good as I'm going to get on this one. It was okay. Boy, this is a tosser, that's for sure. I'm not sure what to tell you on this one. I, I am of two minds. I kind of am too, but mostly I just say it was okay. This was either the worst movie I've seen all year, or this was awesome. I'm not sure if it was awful it's or brilliant. It's kind of both. Is it, it was awful and brilliant at the same time? <laughs> yes, and I think that's exactly what they were shooting for. Yeah. yeah. I don't think this was a poorly made film. I think they got exactly what they were aiming they for. They were doing it on purpose. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Actually, I think it was very well made. Well, we get an ominous voiceover. Then we cut to two kids, Mimi and Luke, playing a weird variation of dodgeball with the most complicated rules you've ever heard. That night, they dig up a huge hole where they find a glowing light in a device. Mimi presses buttons and takes the glowing jewel. And later on, they're like, how did you crack the code? How could you possibly be smart enough to get that out? She's hitting buttons at random. Yeah, yeah. Worked. It worked. Well, they get creeped out and then fill in the hole. They both ask their parents about monsters. And of course, they explain, monsters aren't real. And they both go to bed at 9 o'clock like good children. Luke thinks they woke up Grandma, who died not long ago. Something weird's been happening since they dug that hole. Mimi explains, it's not Grandma. We then see a hand right out of the hole. Was it a grave? The risen monster encounters a trio of robbers and makes a gory mess of them. Mimi and Luke and their parents find the hole the monster came out of, and the two kids decide to track down whatever crawled out of the hole. They find him but he's not what they expected. He gives his supervillain monologue, but when Mimi's crystal starts to glow, she takes charge of the monster. He has to obey her. He does. When she's got the crystal. She names him Psycho Gorman, although he prefers Archduke of Nightmares. Apparently, Psycho Gorman must obey whoever owns the crystal. He continues to threaten eternal suffering, but the two kids don't care. Meanwhile, across the galaxy, a council of aliens wonder who could have cracked the site to release the Archduke. This particular council of aliens would put the Power Rangers to shame. Funny you should mention Power Rangers. (laughs) One of them, Templar Pandora, turns into a human form to track down the escaped alien monster. Meanwhile, the kids ask questions of PG, and he tells them his story. The Templars had enslaved his people but he found the gem which gave him superpowers. Later, he was defeated by the Templars, and they took the gem and hid it. Mimi orders PG to watch a bunch of cartoons and learn how to be nicer. And it does blur the line between good guys and bad guys. Oh, yeah. Because you think initially that he's purely the bad guy and the Templars are like this angelic, you know, savior race. That's certainly the the way it looks. And that's not Not quite quite so... Cut and dried, yeah. Okay, so that instead of watching cartoons, PG used the TV to call his home world and summons reinforcements from his own people. Mimi introduces Psycho Gorman to her parents and friends, and that goes badly. He turns their friend Alistair into a giant tentacled brain thing, and no but one that seems, seems to notice. To be okay, nobody really <laughs> nobody minds. cares. Yeah. Then they make PG play drums in their band. Cue the tweens having fun times with killer alien montage. Uh Mm -hmm. PG comes to Luke in a dream to persuade him to get the crystal away from Mimi. The next day, while playing dodgeball, PG melts a cop. That ain't good. Meanwhile, Pandora arrives on Earth and reads the minds of the surviving policemen. PG's allies arrive as well, and they're a cartoony-looking bunch. You know, they belong right there on He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, Yeah. they did. His gang isn't particularly happy to see him anymore. They were happy with things how how things were before PG's release. Things go badly for PG until he gets permission from Mimi to fight back. PG is seriously wounded, 
and Mimi and her father take him to hide from Pandora. PG can only regain his, regain his strength by possessing the crystal. Meanwhile, Pandora reveals her true form and gives Susan, Mimi's mother, something to drink that changes her into a woman in a rubber suit, too. One of the... One of the Templars. Templars, yes. Finally, it's time for the big battle. Which actually was kind of a cool... All uniform. the costumes are pretty cool. Yes, yeah. Finally, it's time for the big battle between Mimi and Luke, Susan and Greg, and Pandora and Psycho Gorman. But they have to play by Mimi's rules. Yes, it's a big game of weird and complicated dodgeball, and the winner gets the universe. Then they all break out in a chorus of Frig Off, Frig Yourself song. Maybe the worst <laughs> musical ever. Will PG learn a valuable lesson about family? Or will he destroy the galaxy? Could he do both? Both at once. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, this is just a weird movie. It's a comedy. It's a kid's movie. No, it's not. It's gory horror. It's Power Rangers meets Troma. It's lots of things. Yeah, it has that Power Rangers hyper reality overacting creatures and you know villains vibe to it. Uh huh. And yet it's not rated because it's so violent. Oh no, it's definitely not a kid's oh, movie. Oh yeah, you, it's not a kid's <laughs> thing. Yeah, and yet they were. You know, it's still got that vibe to it. You know, so it was weird. It's a kid's movie for adults. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Every time PG talks, it's some over-the-top threat or vow or monologue or flashback to some episodic battle of the pa- epic battle of the past, but he never gets to finish his words because the kids are so much worse than he is. This is why, as a super-powered entity, you should never tie your powers into a MacGuffin, whether it be a Horcrux... Ring of Power, or Red Glowing Crystal. It never ends well. PG is a great character, but the movie is really hurt by the insufferably spoiled Mimi, who is the most annoying little shit ever filmed. Oh, you went there. This kid is supposed to be the heroine, but I kept rooting for PG to turn her into jelly sooner rather than later. It wasn't that kind of movie. Boy, that kid was obnoxious. She was supposed to be the heroine, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the film walks a fine line between really, really high quality and looking very, very low budget. They really took the look of Power Rangers and went full campy comedy horror with it. It's way too gory for kids, but it still kind of feels like a kid's story. It's got a lot of silly rubber suits, cheesy sets, ridiculous humor, but overall it's really, really well done, probably was very high budget, and strangely entertaining. Yes, strangely entertaining, I think is a good way to put it. (laughs) I liked it, but I shouldn't have. (laughs) (laughs) A guilty pleasure, I guess. (laughs) And that's our show for this week. That's about it. All right, are we going to come back next week? Yeah, I think we should do another one. Should we do, like, romance films? No. More horror? More horror. (sighs) With, With eyes. Lots of eyes. Lots of eyes, I, yes. This, this director was obsessed with eyes. <laughs> Next week, we'll watch some Italian imports, all created by Lucio Fulci. We'll start out with the movie Zombie, or Zombie 2 from 1979. And we promised that one this week, but we got we got full up of modern movies instead. So oh. we were going to do that one this week. We'll put it off to next week. Yep. And add, ra- raise it by three more. Mm-hmm. Then we'll watch City of the Living Dead from 1980 and The House by the Cemetery from 1981. Finally, we'll look at The Beyond, also from 1981. And we might find time to squeeze in a short as well. I bet we can. I bet we could. And I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And buy our books at horrorguys.com slash books. And we'll see you next week. Next week. See ya. See ya.